It's almost 50 years since Sir Robin Knox Johnston completed his pioneering non-stop solo circumnavigation of the world. Day 312, about 25 past three on April the 22nd, and Robin Knox Johnson and Sue Haley have sailed non-stop around the world. Nearly three decades later, the Clipper race was born. Sir Robin's concept was clear, sailing the world's toughest oceans in a circumnavigation around the planet. But not for an elite few, these would be everyday people with a thirst for adventure. You know, life is, is for that, to take risks, to follow your dreams. Now in the 11th edition of the biennial race, 700 participants from all walks of life, representing over 40 nationalities, will take on the challenge of dealing with whatever Mother Nature has in store. Battling the elements out on the world's greatest oceans, they will experience some of the toughest conditions imaginable. From hurricane force winds to squalls that can knock a boat flat. From stifling heat to sub-zero conditions and the danger of possible injury. If you could imagine taking a cheese wire and almost cutting down that line. They must learn to live with strangers, sailing 24 hours a day for weeks on end all within the confines of a 70-foot yacht in the middle of the ocean. 40,000 miles, 13 races, 12 identical yachts, six continents, one unique challenge. This is the race of their lives. Coming up, it's an all-Australian adventure for the Clipper Race crews as they sail coast to coast. On reaching Sydney, they join the Blue Ribbon Sydney Hobart Yacht Race with hundreds of other sailors. After seeing in the new year in Tasmania, it's the final race of this leg, racing to the breathtaking Whitsunday Islands. The Clipper Race is a global series of 13 races between six continents over 11 months. Starting in England, the first race is a downward roller coaster to Punta del Este, Uruguay. Race two takes on the South Atlantic to South Africa, and then it's the infamous Southern Ocean sleigh ride. The Australia leg is split into three from Fremantle, including the iconic Sydney Hobart race, ending in Airlie Beach before heading to the city of Sanya in China for the first time. Then it's north to a wintry Qingdao, before crossing the mighty Pacific Ocean to Seattle. The US coast-to-coast -coast leg is two races via the Panama Canal up to New York. The final race leg sees the fleet across the Atlantic Ocean to Northern Ireland, then the last race back to Liverpool. Having left Liverpool, England four months earlier, they have sailed over 12,000 miles in three dramatic races, with stops in Uruguay, Next, a South Atlantic Ocean crossing to Cape Town for an epic visit to this iconic city. Then they completed one of the toughest races across the infamous Southern Ocean, with a series of incidents that tested the crews to their limits. It was challenging and emotional. Fremantle Sailing Club hosts the Clipper Race, and all the crews are now enjoying the warmth of this famous sailing city on the coast of Western Australia. It also hosted the epic America's Cup event 40 years ago, and offers the Clipper Race plenty of attractions. It's time for new crew members joining in Australia to arrive. Hello, I'm Hannah McLeod. And among them is a highly competitive new recruit. Hannah McLeod is an Olympic gold medalist, having won with the England hockey team in Rio. Now, after completing her four weeks of clipper race training, she is set to embark on her next adventure and race coast to coast around Australia over the next six weeks. But first, she has the chance to inspire some of the local hockey players, also aspiring for gold. Myself and my teammates as well, they all say there's, there's a moment, a moment that really inspires you. So for me, it was watching Barcelona Olympics on TV. 
and for whatever reason I saw those Great Britain athletes winning Olympic medals and was like hooked, like that's what I want to do. I know just how important it is, particularly for events like this. Um, the conversations that you have, you, you, could, you could literally inspire someone to achieve whatever it is they want to achieve. We're only 14, 15 year olds, like all dreaming about wanting to go to the Olympics and go to that next level and to have someone that experience come and talk to us, it's really great to be able to listen to the insight she has and the knowledge that she's learned about the sport. Oh, I think it's so good. I honestly, I think it's such a, you know, this high profile hockey player and is doing the sailing around everywhere. So it's really good to, you know, do something different, get out of your comfort zone. So I think it's really cool that she's doing something else rather than just hockey. I got one. So there is excitement in the air as the crews head for their final briefing before the start. So we've just attended the crew briefing, um, which is where it kind of starts to sink in and it all feels very real. I'm looking forward to actually sailing. Um, it's been absolutely mad in port, just getting the boats prepped, um, going through a lot of the kind of safety reviews. Uh, I'm doing the vitaline for the boat, so I've, I've seen more of a supermarket than I have a boat, um, so I'm really excited to get going. I just can't wait to get on that start line. It looks so exciting. Big start here in Fremantle, uh, lovely day. Uh, hopefully the Fremantle doctor is blowing in full force, get a good, good quick start. Uh, going into Sydney, I think that'll be that'll be epic. Uh, I mean, it's really tight going in, and then we'll yeah, see Sydney is such an iconic city, and I've never been before, so it'll be amazing. And so once again, the Clipper race crews bid their farewells as they ready to leave the dock to cheers and music to head out to sea for the race to Sydney. In this 2,600 nautical mile race four, the Clipper Telemed Tasman Test, the crews will travel further south than at any other point in the Clipper race. There are extra points available with the Elliott Brown Ocean Sprint and a scoring gate, but no crew has decided to play their joker card and double their points for the finishing position. I've got a point that way to put the main up. So once I've cleared of him... We'll Aboard the UNICEF yacht, skipper Bob Beggs knows these waters well and is excited to get going with his crew, having just won the previous race yeah, across the, the Southern up. Ocean. Once they've got the mains up, they'll, they'll fall in behind. So it's... Uh, uh, UNICEF is race control very quickly. The, the yachts line up for the start, all of them vying for a leading position out of Fremantle. Aboard the UNICEF yacht, the crew are keen buoyed by their success in the race across the Southern Ocean. At the far end of the start line, the crew of the Chinese entry Sanya Serenity Coast appear to have made a good start. As the Great Britain, Liverpool 2018, and Qingdao crews all cross the start line safely. This is a short inshore course to begin with for spectators and crew alike to enjoy. But the yachts are soon heeled over at 45 degrees and shoot off towards the horizon to begin the two-week race to Sydney, with Sanya Serenity Coast leading the fleet. Coming up, 
Team UNICEF Spinnaker of Hope is in action on the race course. The one they are using to raise money for charity. The Clipper race crews are battered by rough weather as they battle for positions and points through the scoring gate. And there's a warm welcome as they arrive in time for Christmas. The Clip Around the World Yacht Race is a 40,000 mile adventure for amateur sailors over 11 months. The 11 race crews have left Australia's west coast and begun the Clipper Telemed Tasman Test race to Sydney, expected to take around two weeks. With three races over a seven week period, this leg offers a real diversity of locations and conditions. It's this that makes it very popular among the crew. One crew member only signed up for the first race from England to Uruguay, but the attraction of this leg was too exciting to miss. I saw with my grandfather when he had a small sailboat in Brittany, uh, back in France when I was a kid or a teenager. Then I did some laser, some hobby cats, some windsurfing but never in a racing environment, never offshore, and never with 23 people on board a 70-foot 70 70 feet, uh, boat. Because I love sailing, and I really wanted to try my luck at doing offshore racing and doing some challenging conditions as well. Uh, and then I re-signed up for legs four as well because I love leg one, and I really wanted to go back and do more extreme things and challenge myself even more. I think it's great to have three different races which have very different weathers, um, and especially in that order, starting with cold, going to very hot and gorgeous, hopefully. That's why I really wanted to, to be done with my notice at work to be back for leg four, because I really wanted to experiment that variety of first race settings. So we have a very, you know, two weeks race at the beginning, then we have a short race, and we have, a, again, a long race, and all of them in different kind of settings and also racing spirits. Um, so that was really important for me to have this kind of hot weather, cold weather, storm, Southern Ocean, short race Sydney Hobart, uh, this kind of mix for like four. It was definitely an appeal to me. Also joining Team UNICEF is Cameron McCracken, who at the age of just 18 years old is the youngest sailor among the crew. My reasons for signing up probably aren't as poetic as many other people's reasons, uh, essentially. Um, one day I was introduced to it by my dad, who'd seen it on the internet or something. Uh, so I looked it up and thought, that's just what I want to do. I'm pretty outgoing, very sort of sporty. Um, I mean, in all sports that I play, I'm really competitive. Um, yeah, I used to cry when I was a child when I lost, so there's, maybe that's a bit of insight for you. There's a really good sort of teaching, learning mentality on the boat. Uh, in which there's, you've got the core people like Paul, Miriam there on um, my watch, and then you've got John, Seamus, uh, Alison. Um, just really brilliant people to help all the, the new guys um, settle in. And the, I'm lucky enough to be on a crew that um, bonds so well and has gelled in a really good way um, to make us a fast crew. By the fourth day of the race, the leading teams enter the start of the Elliott Brown Ocean Sprint, marked by two lines of longitude. The fastest three teams score bonus points. The race is led by Chinese entry Sanya Serenity Coast, but UNICEF's crew have sailed well and are presently second. But it's tight with just five nautical miles between the first five teams. Another exciting close race. The UNICEF team have embraced the official Clipper Race charity wholeheartedly and are actively fundraising at every stopover port. They are racing with a special spinnaker of support. People are invited to sign the spinnaker for a donation, enabling them to be part of the actual race. UNICEF is the official race charity and there are a number of ways that we can contribute to UNICEF, which is a very worthy charity. And one of those uh, that we came up with is what we're calling the spinnaker of support. and that's. This is our spinnaker here um, from the Team UNICEF boat. We have three spinnakers. This is our code, we call it code three, the one for heaviest weather. And what we're doing is for a donation, uh, people can come and write a message of support or sign their name or draw a little figure or whatever they would like. And then in the race, we actually, you know, when the conditions are correct, we'll fly the spinnaker. We've done this now for all three legs that I've been on in Uruguay, Cape Town, and now here in Fremantle. 
and we have team members, other teams as well. I think uh, having your name on something and then you know it's in the race is gonna make you follow it more closely online or on the website in the race viewer. However, while racing towards Sydney, the UNICEF team suffer a disaster when they drop their spinnaker as it becomes entangled. It's a real problem for the crew, who battle to free it without causing damage. But the strengthening wind makes it even harder to manage, and the damage is done. Now the sail repair team aboard will be kept busy for the rest of the race. A week into the race, and the rough weather continues to the south of Australia but the crews battle on across the Clipper race fleet. With all eyes on the weather ahead, UNICEF have fallen slightly off the pace after their spinnaker drama, and like much of the now spread out fleet, have sailed into a wind hole as they approach Tasmania. Experienced sailor and around the world crew member Paul Bidwell knows just how frustrating running into a patch of sea with no wind can be. As soon as you sail into one, it's almost like um, someone just flicking a switch and the wind just going. It's, uh, it, it, sometimes it dies gradually, invariably it dies really quite quickly. You just literally stop. Um, the wind sometimes sort of veers, backs, um, turns in all different directions. Um, concentration then is, is probably needed more than, than when you're surfing down the big waves or you're going head to wind in strong winds. It's, that's, that's when the concentration should really, um, really take a key role in, um, in the success of your leg, really. Um, when you do fall in the wind hole, obviously everybody from the back of the pack tends to sort of catch up on you. Uh, hopefully you get out of the wind hole before they get in it. Um, and, and, and if they do get in it, then you, you hope that they stay there for the length of time that you've been in it. So, it, yeah, they're, they're, they're frustrating, but they can be used to your advantage if, um, if you can see other boats in them. With the wind filling, the crew head into the infamous Bass Strait for the first of what will be three crossings of this stretch of water. UNICEF are still in the top half of the fleet, but up ahead, there's a fiercely close battle taking place between the crews of Sanya Serenity Coast and Visit Seattle the two just a few miles apart as they race for the finish line off Sydney Harbour. For novice sailor Cameron, his first major race has been an exciting experience, but he's relished the bonds he's formed. It's been really good. I mean, the sailing's been fun. Uh, the only real challenge is probably the sleep and the living. So living, just moving around generally, um, one watch coming down, one watch going up. It's very crowded, very compact space, so, yeah, it can be quite difficult. I think the sleep deprivation's really sort of got to me a bit. It does drag a bit when you're, um, you know, you're kicking through a 4 to 8 a.m. support watch, um, and you know you've only got the four hours afterwards to try and fit in as much sleep as possible. Paul, although he's been sailing for over twice as long as I've been alive, is sort of like a, a brother. So he's, he was sort of coaching me through what he knows. So that's really nice. He's hopefully going to be on my uh, watch for the rest of leg four. Obviously, we don't know whether we're going to change the watch system or anything yet. So um, looking forward to um, sailing with him more. Meanwhile, the leading pair of teams have been in close contention, but it's Sanya Serenity Coast who take line honours and a full 12 points. They finish just 18 minutes ahead of Visit Seattle, who pushed them all the way. This is Australian skipper Wendy Tuck's second circumnavigation with a clipper race, and her experience is showing as she guides her crew to their first victory since leaving the UK four months earlier. Friends and family are there to greet the crew as they arrive at the dock. The teamwork with extraordinary, you know. Everyone's just jumped up leaps and bounds, and one of the teams is calling us the cool running team, the Swiss people, because we just do everything so smick now, which I hope it doesn't mean that we're arrogant about it, but um, 
which is a really nice compliment to the crew, and that's perfect because it's the crew that won the race, not me. I'm the one who just says, let's go here, let's go there. So they're the one that won. Not far behind them is the crew of Visit Seattle, led by the only other female skipper in the Clipper race, Nikki Henderson from the UK. And the crew are clearly already entering into the festive Christmas spirit. The end was awesome. Um, you know, I spent a lot of time racing in shore at home, and, and it was like a little bit of that mixed with ocean racing, you know, playing the land shifts and a um, little tacking war with Wendo and Chris. It was, it was good fun. Of all the people I could have lost to, I was happy to, to come second to Wendo, definitely. And she's a brilliant, brilliant sailor. So, um, no, really chuffed for her. Third into the harbour is the crew of Chinese entry Qingdao. Their first podium finish in this edition of the race, securing 10 points towards the overall race title. With the whole Clipper race fleet safely arrived at the Cruising Yacht Club of Australia, the first items of the agenda for the cruise, after some sleep and a hot bath, are the deep clean of the yacht and sail repairs. Looking ahead to the next race, preparations are underway for one of sailing's most iconic races from Sydney to Hobart in Tasmania. The mass crew brief focuses on the weather and the strict rules and regulations in place for the 102 crews participating. Now in its 73rd year, the famous Sydney Hobart race has a long history for drama and excitement. It's an iconic race. It's one of three of the big races that a lot of yachties try to do. Uh, I've done a few. This would be my sixth. Uh, and you're always learning. You're always, there are things to do and things not to do in a Sydney Hobart, and you learn new ones every time out there. So uh, it's a learning curve. It's fun. It's three or four days of short, sharp, adrenaline and yeah no it's good fun it's just nice it's almost christmas in the sweltering heat of sydney but the teams must focus on supplies for the race ahead for skipper wendy this is the 11th time she has competed two years earlier she guided her crew to victory and won the jane tate memorial trophy as the first female skipper to reach hobart it's a tough race even though it's a lot shorter than what we're used to it's still a tough race so it's nothing to just uh take for granted at all. Boats come from all over the world to compete in this. It's one of those tough ocean races that's renowned over, around the world. Because uh, you usually have a bit of everything, a bit of light, a bit of nothing, no wind, then big subtly come through. You get stuck in the Derwin at night, generally there's no wind there, so it's a very tactical race. Uh, I've already warned my crew to keep their heads in the boat. Everyone is going to want to stare and look at all the spectacle going on, but it's going to be heading boat time to just be ready for any manoeuvre at any time, basically. This is slightly different because we're a bigger boat, a lot more crew. Uh, but I've sailed with the crew a lot longer now, so it's a completely different kettle of fish. Uh, everything happens a little bit slower on a clipper boat just because everything's so much bigger and heavier, so slightly different, but a lot more fun. Christmas Day and in traditional style, Santa is paying a visit to international crew staying in the marina. While the Clipper Race sailors have formed strong friendships in the preceding months, it highlights that many of them are away from home and missing loved ones. Yeah, a little bit sad because uh, I spoke to my family all yesterday and uh, said Merry Christmas to them. But actually, this, yeah, this is pretty, pretty good fun. The uh, old Clipper family here. Um, went out and had a few drinks yesterday and taking it pretty easy today, but yeah, having Christmas dinner with my Clipper family, so it's going to be very cool. Yeah. It's a bit weird because it's uh, summertime, but trying our best. Um, a couple of the girls from Garmin, Bill, she's uh, got her family over from New Zealand, so she's invited some of us there for, for Christmas dinner, so I'm really looking forward to it. It'll be like a family away from family. Coming up, the fleet departs Sydney in one of sailing's most famous events, racing to Hobart in Tasmania. TeamHotelPlanner.com show great sportsmanship and skill as they come to the aid of another competitor 
while the big super maxis blast downwind in search of a record time. And the Clipper race crews experience their own adventures in the shortest race of this incredible circumnavigation of the planet. The Clipper Round the World Yacht Race has reached the other side of the world, having left from Liverpool in the UK just four months earlier. Now in sunny Sydney, the crews are ready for their next race after a long stop over here, basking in the Australian warmth. It's Boxing Day, the traditional start date for all the Sydney Hobart competitors. The Clipper race crews are down at the yachts early, loading on clothes and vital last-minute supplies. It's the shortest race of all in this circumnavigation of the planet, at just 630 nautical miles. But in terms of prestige, it's one of the biggest in sailing. Sydney Hobart, we've been waiting all year for this race, so it's been a hard six months to get here. So we're all on board trying to get everything put away, tidied up so we can race really fast tonight. I have really no appreciation of what I'm about to, you know, to enter into, um, but I've just heard incredible things. So yeah, the butterflies are definitely going in the stomach, but I can't wait to get out there just to kind of face into it almost. So um, yeah, it should be amazing though. As the yachts depart one by one from the marina aboard Sanya Serenity Coast, Skipper Wendy is heading into her 11th Sydney Hobart race and looking for another good result. The day is overcast and grey, and there is only a slight breeze in Sydney Harbour. There are thousands of boats on the water to watch, and the big 100-foot yachts are sure to be as competitive as ever in the first wave of the three-tiered start line. All right, let's get ready to dive, guys. Mate, see in. There's nervousness in the crowded race corridor, but aboard PSP Logistics, it's skipper let's Matt Mitchell's start, third time here with the Clipper race, and he continues to coach the crew as they count down to the start. It's one of the biggest sporting events on the Australian calendar, shown live on national TV, with hundreds of thousands of spectators making a day of it, crowding the best vantage points early on Boxing Day. The Clipper race crews are on the second start line behind the faster maxi yachts, and as the clock ticks down, the excitement and tension builds. This is unlike any other start line that crews have experienced so far. Up at South Head overlooking the harbour, there are many Clipper Race supporters in the massed crowds watching this spectacle as it gets underway. The three start lines are designed to separate longer, faster yachts from the slower ones. And as the start gun booms, they are off on another epic race to Hobart. It's not the quickest of starts due to the light wind, but with the Maxi's massive sails, the size of a Boeing 747 wing, these yachts are making good headway as they leave the rest of the competitors behind. Aboard Sanya Serenity Coast, Skipper Wendo, as she's known, is making a cautious start in the crowded harbour, surrounded by scores of other race yachts of all sizes. One of the favourites for the race title is Wild Oats 11, with its all-star crew aboard and a string of notable victories behind it. With Clipper race yachts tacking for position, it's tense aboard, and there's a near collision between two leading yachts when Wild Oats 11 tacks right in front of LDV Comanche from the USA as the Clipper crews get to grips with their own battles further behind. Nice work, folks. There is action throughout the entire bay as the yachts gradually make their way towards the famous entrance called the Sydney Heads and out towards the open ocean. Although the wind was light, once again the start of the Sydney Hobart race has been a spectacle to behold. And skipper Wendy's experience has paid dividends as she guides her crew out to sea safely and into third position in Clipper Race 5 behind the PSP Logistics and Qingdao teams. So a dramatic and tiring day, one that Clipper race crews will never forget. As for many, it's the biggest race start they have ever or may ever be involved in. As night draws in, 
the crews are well into the routine of the watch system, and with the increasing wind, the battle for positions and points is truly on. There are two former Clipper race yachts representing the Invictus Games, crewed by service veterans undertaking their own Ashes on the Water with a British and an Australian crew. With Clipper Race Chairman Sir Robin Knox Johnston on the all-British crew as navigator, the idea of this race was seen as a way to engage injured service personnel to take on new challenges. And they have all risen to the occasion admirably. Racing on the previous generation Clipper 68-foot yachts, the crew have all undergone special training ahead of the race and are as competitive as any other crews taking part. It's the next morning, and at the front of the race, the stripped-out maxi yachts are enjoying the downwind conditions and are on course for a possible record finish time. The battle between Wild Oats and LDV Comanche remains close, but with the threat of a protest hanging in the air, hopes of victory could be dashed. The Clipper race crews are enjoying their own battle with the main Sydney Hobart race, and PSP Logistics have carved out a slim lead over the other 10 yachts, but all are in close contention. Skipper Matt outlines the situation. We're doing really well. We had a really good night last night, um, and we maintained our first position. The only AIS targets we can see are the, only, are the Clipper boats, so we're all um, matching each other speed for speed. We've got 368 miles to go um, to Tasman Island, which is on the bottom corner of the Derwent. Um, and basically, uh, with the speeds we're doing and what we expect to maintain, we should be there within 36 hours or so. And then it's the last, uh, the last home straight up into up into the Derwent River and into Hobart. Further behind, the crew of Sanya Serenity Coast are keeping up the pressure under Wendy's expert guidance. She knows the infamous Bass Strait as well as anyone, and just how fickle the wind and the currents can be. I'm just looking at how far into the shore we go and if we stay in the current or forget about current and go further inshore. So it's all about the current and the forecast and how close to shore we go. And when we get down the bottom of Tasmania, there could be a very fluky bit as the wind changes to a very weak low front coming through, which means the winds will change quite substantially in direction. Um, and it might be a, a nice reach, which will be lovely sailing across Storm Bay, which is quite, can be quite notorious. Um, then, depending on what time we get to the river, we hope we don't want to get to the river at night time because it generally shuts down with not much breeze there. But um, again, I've sailed up there a lot, so I've got some good intel of what sites to be on. But, you know, sometimes it's just the luck of the draw when you get somewhere, so... The Xania Serenity Coast team has many Chinese crew and also a professional media crew member who photographs, videos and writes stories for the fans back home. It's a full-time job keeping on top of the demands. Everybody is, has so much experience of their life, of how to like, uh, deal with people and has uh, their, their own living life. So to me, the big challenge is how to inspire them to tell me their story behind the scene and, and like to know why they're here, what they are looking for, even what they are running from. I, I feel like my eyes open, probably after I introduce and share the story, share the experience back to China, maybe we'll bring a lot of more people, get to know what's offshore sailing like, get to know what's clipper around the world race like. Maybe they will get some interest of to think, all right, this may be a chance when we want to change our own life. By the close of the second day, Clipper Race Class leaders PSP Logistics are still 24 hours from the finish. But the Super Maxi yachts have come through a huge wind hole, which sees LDV Comanche overtaken by Wild Oats 11, who crossed the finish line at dusk, with huge crowds celebrating this popular Australian win. Wild Oats 11 wins the 73rd, Rolex Sydney Hobart.
close behind, having led for most of the race until hitting a huge wind hole at the foot of Tasmania, LDV Comanche finishes second across the line in the darkness. But there is controversy. The owners lodge a protest around an incident at the start of the race, and so the arguments will be heard next morning, leaving the final result hanging in the balance. You know, there was an incident there inside Sydney Harbour, which I, I think was you know, totally innocent, and, and um, we, we did exactly what we had to do in that situation to you know, keep the boat safe and uh, in one piece, and, and that's what we did. So I'm not concerned about it at all. Um, if those guys want to protest us on that sort of situation, well, I guess that's their, their call, but it's, um, it's just, you know, that's yacht racing, and we'll see how we go. Meanwhile, as time rolls on, the Clipper race crews now reach the same wind shadow off Hobart that affected the larger yachts at the mouth of the River Derwent. After leading, PSP Logistics are becalmed with no wind, searching for any breeze they can find, with the rest of the teams closing rapidly behind. Ahoy. For the crew of Sanya Serenity Coast, the sight of new race leaders Garmin and many of the other yachts becalmed energizes them as they approach from a different angle through the night, rapidly working their way up from eighth position. Um, what we're doing now, we're just going towards the finish or the entrance of the river, so. We've still got 14 miles of tough racing to go. You can see boat just there. Um, our only advantage is we're to windward of them. We do turn to starboard when we get up here, so it's close as, though. Um, at the moment, we're doing all right. Can't say it because I'm worried about everything. You both did exactly what we did, how we read the rules. Um, it's going to be a tough call, but who knows? It's a tight finish to the race, with the crew of Sanya Serenity Coast now in a close battle with Garmin. The tactics from here will be crucial. How far to the line? As they race up wind towards the finish line in Hobart. Nearly there, folks. So, for the second successive time, Wendy takes line honours in the Clipper race class and is also the first female skipper to finish in the Sydney Hobart race. A fabulous result for the crew. There are celebrations too for the crew of Garmin as they finish just two minutes behind in second place, their best result in the Clipper race so far. And third across the line is the crew of NASDAQ, their first podium position since leaving the UK. Arriving at Kings Pier Marina in Hobart, there are celebrations all round, saluted by the enthusiastic crowds enjoying this yachting spectacular. positions were up and down all through the race. We were happy, we were sad, we were happy, we were sad. The one thing about my crew, we never give up. So at the end, we must have done, a, no, I'm going to exaggerate, maybe a thousand head sail changes or kite changes at the end. And the crew probably hate me, but it works, it worked. After the protest hearing, LDV Comanche is declared the line honours winner over Wild Oats 11, who are given an hour time penalty. Coming up, the crews enjoy the New Year's celebrations in Hobart. We join the Great Britain team as they race up to the wondrous Whitsunday Islands. And it's the end of Hannah's epic Australian adventure. The first Clipper race crews have completed one of the most challenging blue ribboned yachting events in the world, racing from Sydney to Hobart. And now the rest of the teams are battling for positions into Hobart after the shortest race in their epic circumnavigation of the world. Approaching the final stretch of the course is Hotelplanner.com, who suspended their race near Sydney in order to rescue a fellow sailor from the Invictus Australia crew who fell overboard. They showed great skill and seamanship in achieving the rescue and then returned him to his own yacht. 
under race rules, they are entitled to a time redress by the race committee, and this could affect the overall Clipper race result on corrected time difference. The Invictus challenge in this race is ahead of Sydney hosting the Games in 2018, and will introduce sailing competition for the first time. The winners here are the British team. Well, I think actually this has been my best one. Um, the crew are just fantastic. I've never met people so willing to just get stuck in. I think if you've seen the way they're handling evolutions, uh, it was brilliant. I mean, this, we were handling them like a professional crew. They may not have done much saving, but boy, they know how to learn, they know how to pick things up, they know how to make it happen. They were just great to be with. I mean, every evolution we did, it was just like, click, click, click. fantastic. With the racing finished, Hobart is full. Not only are there the crews from 102 yachts, but a huge food festival is also taking place over the New Year holidays, called the Taste of Tasmania. It certainly delights the taste buds of hungry sailing crews. Now it's time for the awards ceremony of this prestigious race and to recognize the efforts of all involved. Third in the Clipper 17 division, First female skipper, and she did it two years ago, she's done it again. Sanya, Serenity Coast, Wendy Tuck. CYCA Trophy, Hotel Planner. Don and on corrected time, it's first place in Clipper Race 5 for the crew of hotelplanner.com. A fabulous result. the Clipper race crews have been looking forward to, with the famous fireworks display in Hobart to celebrate the arrival of a new year. And it's quite a party. Too quickly, the time in Hobart is up and the Clipper race crews are focused on the next challenge, which will take them all the way up the east coast of Australia. For Hannah McLeod, it's the final race of her Australian adventure. It's been a fantastic time in Hobart, but um, it's, it's, it's a good time now to, to get going. It's strange having had kind of a bit of time on land now and um, hopefully just get back to how we performed in the Sydney Hobart. We're starting to piece together things as a team. Um, we're looking pretty sharp, but it's, it's getting back into the rhythm of things as quickly as possible. So this is my last race. Um, it's, it's odd. I haven't thought too much of it, to be fair. Um, and everyone I've spoken to, whenever it's their kind of last race or last leg, or it's like, oh, yeah, well, I might be signing up for another one. So I think it becomes quite addictive. Um, so we'll have to wait and see. OK, head up, head up. Into the race start and aboard the Great Britain yacht, everyone is keen to enjoy the two-week race and the expected rise in temperatures. Okay, trim, it's a line start and the crews of UNICEF and Garmin cross quickly as they head into the wind on the Derwent River. Crews are in close company with the yachts heeled over and sailing well in a fresh breeze. Idyllic conditions for the start of race six to the wondrous Whit Sundays. It's certainly competitive between the Dare to Lead and UNICEF crews as they head upriver. Gradually, the teams spread out as they tack their way towards the mouth of the river, with PSP Logistics and Visit Seattle leading in what should be a two week race north, crossing the Bass Straits for the third time. For novice sailor Hannah aboard the Great Britain yacht, it's been quite an Australian experience. 
My sailing experience previous to Clipper was um, absolutely zero. So my, my first experience was actually level one training. Um, so an absolute novice when I, when I started this journey. By joining the race, I was hoping to gain um, just a, a feeling of being a beginner again, literally learning something, being out of my comfort zone. And this is a completely different world to me. Um, I've got a whole new appreciation of, of certainly Mother Nature. We've seen it at its, at its best and its worst. Um, and to be back in a team environment, in a very different environment than the, what I'm used to. But so you pick things up so quickly with the amount of time we obviously spend sailing out here. So. Um, it's been brilliant, um, well outside my comfort zone, but um, an incredible experience. It's been a roller coaster experience for fellow crewmate Pip since leaving home in the UK having sailed over halfway around the world. Um, it's, it's been incredible, really. I mean, if I look back to when we left Liverpool, it seems like such a long time ago and so much has happened, and I'm halfway around the world, about to come into Airlie Beach and, and got here by boat. So it's, it's been pretty amazing, really. I think I've learned that I'm a lot braver than I thought I was, um, a lot more resilient than I thought I was. Um, I always used to think that I get, got quite irritated by small things and, you know, especially in my old job and, and with old colleagues and stuff, you know, you get a bit frustrated with people and actually there's no room for anything like that on the boat. You've got to, you've got to all get on with each other and you've got to all pull together and, and get the job done. Another thing I think I've learned about myself is I really love laughing. I think. It's, it's such a, a, a good medicine for everybody. If, if anybody, you know, if you're feeling low or, or if you need cheering up, having a good laugh it really is, is a great way of making you feel better. So I encourage that as much as possible on the boat, whether it's awful jokes or playing pranks on people. Um, I think it's really important that we all laugh together and make us a better, better and a stronger crew. And I think other highs have been just the achievement of what we've, we've done so far. You know, as, as I've said, we've come all the way to Early Beach, nearly, and we've done it by boat. I mean, that's just incredible. And I, I never thought, you know, a couple of years ago, if you told me I'd be, be in this position, I'd be about to arrive in Early Beach by boat, I would have laughed at you. So it's, it's an incredible high just thinking about what we've done um, and what we've achieved so far. Racing north offshore, the crew of Qingdao feel the force of nature's wrath. A major storm engulfs them, and their yacht is struck by lightning. It's a terrifying moment as the lightning strikes the mast and travels all the way down to the comms room, blowing out most of their electrical instruments. No one is injured, but many vital systems are knocked out, and so the crew must continue on with basic instrumentation and communications. As the fleet races up the eastern coast of Australia, the heat intensifies. Life aboard becomes almost intolerable as the wind drops and the mercury rises. The heat is pretty bad. Um, I can't quite believe that we coped with like three weeks of this on leg one when I think everybody is finding it so hard on this race. You either bake on deck with a nice breeze but the sun's really, really hot or you go down below and it's just stifling humidity. We've got quite a lot of fans um, throughout the boat. Um, everybody seems to have their own personal 3D fans. I've decided that on the next, uh, on leg five, when we have this heat again, I'm going to set up at least 10 fans around me in my bunk as a full body air conditioning um, to try and get the best sleep possible. Waiting for the cruise are the wondrous Whitsunday Islands and the opportunity of a long rest at the end of this Australian experience before their next adventure to Asia. Carving out a lead, the crew of Visit Seattle enjoy another great race and claim their first victory after completing this 1,600 nautical mile race in 11 days. The crew of PSP Logistics finished just five nautical miles behind them, having been tested by a wide range of conditions through this race. And the crew of Liverpool 2018 are delighted to finish third, their best results so far. The 
race was really tough, actually. Um, tougher than any of us were expecting, just all sorts of conditions, um, you know, from wind holes to 50, 60 knots with those southerly busters, tactical shifts, and, you know, it was a, it was a challenging race. Oh, it feels great being on the podium. Um, you know, the last uh, couple of races in leg four, we've been <laughs> very close. Um, you know, we were leading the whole Sydney Hobart race and then got knocked down by the wind hole. And then uh, the race before that, we were just uh, just behind third. So it's, uh, it's great to be on the podium again in leg four. After good performances in Australia, the two Chinese entries top the overall leaderboard, just two points separating them, while the crew of Visit Seattle move into third place ahead of Dare to Lead. But just one poor result could change everything, so the pressure is on. For Hannah, it's the end of her Australian sailing adventure. It's a very strange feeling, like, absolutely amazing to have finally got here. It brings it at the end of my journey with Clipper. Um, and so I'm a little, I am a little bit sad and like, I've learned so much, it's almost a waste to, to walk away now. You do have that, or oh, maybe just another leg. Um, but I think it, it, you'll become, yeah, you get hooked. You get hooked, that's for sure. So it's certainly not the end of my, uh, my involvement in sailing. And so it's Liverpool 2018 that takes to the stage for their first podium finish. Followed by the crew of PSP Logistics. But celebrating first place, it's Visit Seattle with their first victory. Next time, the Clipper race crews embark on their Asia Pacific experience as they head into China for two spectacular destinations. Crews celebrate Chinese New Year at sea and swelter in the baking tropical heat. There's a second visit by King Neptune as a father and son cross the equator and tears shed for loved ones missed on Valentine's Day. All this and more in The Race of Their Lives.